All right, welcome back everybody. Today we're going to be making a German style Pilsner. So I've kind of been on a, uh, a session style non-high ABV beer kick for a while. So I've been doing, you know, a session IPA, which is under 5%. I did a Munich Dunkel, which is under 5%. I'm going to do this German Pilsner, which is going to be somewhere around 5%. That'd be nice to kind of wrap up my summer beer brewing sessions. Uh, so I think I'll start moving towards heavier things after this. But um, lagers are fun, and now that I've got this keyser to do actual lager fermentations in, it's getting way easier. So I'm enjoying brewing them, and uh, today we're going to be doing our second lager of the year, a German Pilsner. They're very, very crispy, nice, and just easy to drink on a hot summer day, which is the goal of what we're doing here. So. I'm going to try and just do the best we can with a very simple recipe. It's uh, one grain, ten and a half pounds of German Pilsner malt. This should get us somewhere in the neighborhood of an OG around like 1040 to 1050, uh, which sets us up nicely for a 4 to 5 percent beer. Uh, for hops, I'm going to bitter it with pearl. So we're going to add one ounce of pearl at 60 minutes and that gives us about 30-ish IBUs of bitterness. Um, and then I'm going to add 0.7 ounces of Hallertau at 10 minutes and then a full ounce at zero minutes. So we have a nice aromatic, uh, noble sort of hop uh, aroma to this. And then for yeast, I'm going to use Y Yeast 2124 Bohemian Lager. Now, uh, I have used this yeast before when I was brewing my Hellas Lager, uh, and it worked really well. Finished out really nice, dropped out very clean, so I'm looking forward to using that. However, when I brewed that beer, I think I started the fermentation a bit too hot. Uh, and hence got a lot of banana esters, so we want to definitely keep that under control now. Thanks to my handy fermentation chamber slash uh, keyser, we should be good to go with that. I have a yeast starter for that going right now. It's been going for a couple days. Today when we brew, I'm going to cool it down as far as I can with my chiller, and then we'll drop it into the keyser and let it further cool down. Uh, and then I'll be pitching that starter in the morning tomorrow. If my homebrew shop had Y-Yeast 2247, the European Lager 2, uh, handy, I probably would have grabbed that instead of the Bohemian Lager, uh, simply because most people seem to recommend that as a better yeast uh, in terms of not leaving too much residual sugar in the beer. I think we'll be just fine with the 2124 anyway. Okay, so water. Um, this is one of those styles that is extremely uh, difficult to brew if you have anything but perfectly soft water. Uh, so mineral free water. Basically I could go to the store and go buy eight and a half gallons of distilled water and then build from there, but I'm not going to do that because this is a lawnmower beer and I'm going to drink it really fast. Uh, I'm not planning on entering it into any competitions or anything. Um, I'm just giving this as an example of what your average home brewer is going to have uh, trying to brew a Pilsner on standard city water. So my water, for example, uh, it is pretty high in minerals. It's got a high amount of chloride, a low amount of sulfate, and a medium level of sodium in there. So what happens is basically I get really good malty beers out of that uh, if I don't touch my water at all. Um, but we don't want this one to be too much on the malty side because that's gonna throw off the delicate balance. It's a delicate beer. Um, so I'm gonna try and add a little bit of gypsum, a little bit of Epsom. That's gonna boost my calcium and magnesium levels so I can get a good mash and good color out of it. Uh, but I'm also gonna raise the sulfate levels just a bit, try to keep it balanced, um, but without adding so much that my beer becomes something else entirely. Now, depending on how critically fine-tuned you want this beer to be, uh, it might be worth getting that actual extra distilled water or reverse osmosis water to brew with or to build this water profile from. I'm going to show that you can make an acceptable beer that your family, friends, coworkers, whoever you serve your beer to, uh, outside of a BJCP judge is probably going to be happy with the result. And I think the vast majority of home brewers out there are not trying to go out and win competitions with every single brew that they make. However, if you want to win a competition, you have to have the perfect water profile for it. So just keep that in mind. I am not trying to show you in this video how to brew a competition winning German Pilsner. I'm showing you how to brew a German Pilsner. It's going to taste pretty good. So with that, this is what ends up being my actual water profile. 22 parts per million of calcium, 8 parts per million of magnesium, 65 parts per million of sodium, as for my base profile, 55 parts per million of sulfate, 100 parts per million of chloride, and that's also for my base profile, and 36 parts per million of carbonate. 
So we're adding two grams of gypsum, one gram of epsom to boost the calcium, magnesium, and sulfate levels there just a little tiny bit. So for mash, we're gonna mash this at a pretty low temperature uh, of 147 degrees for 90 minutes. Uh, so what that does is that allows us to have a very, uh, very light bodied, very easy drinking beer um, that makes a relatively fermentable wort. So keep that in mind. With uh, keeping in mind the things that I said earlier, uh, I think this is going to be a very enjoyable beer. It's definitely gonna be fun to brew. And so long as we nail that lager fermentation process, it'll be a very nice, clean, crispy result uh, with a nice, hopefully balanced beer at the end of the day. If it's a little malty, I personally don't mind. Okay, so we've hit our targeted strike water temperature, so now it's time to remove the heat stick, put the bag in, and start doing in the greens. Okay, so our mash temperature is starting out at about 149, uh, which is, yeah, it's a little higher than I expected, but that's okay considering that my system typically loses a degree or two over the course of the mash, uh, so we should be fine. All right, so it's 10 minutes into the mash right now, so it's time to take a quick approximation of the pH and the mash using pH strips. All right, looks like it's about 5.5, um, which is about in the right neighborhood of where we wanna be. Ideally, it's 5.2, but this obviously doesn't have the same precision as an actual pH meter. Okay, so the 90 minute mash is complete, so we're gonna go ahead and unwrap all of this and uh, quickly check the temperature to see how we did. Okay, so it's about 145 degrees, um, which is uh, a four degree loss. And I'm gonna blame that 100% on me being a complete idiot and forgetting to put my brewing salts in. So uh, I, I actually had to take the whole thing apart, take the top off, uh, add the brewing salts, mix it up, and then put it all back together uh, with about an hour left in the mash. So. Number one, the salts got in there and the water profile did get fixed and adjusted, of course. Uh, however, at the same time, I definitely lost a little bit more heat than I would expect. So finishing at 145, um, it's basically the rock bottom of what we want for our uh, mashing temperature spectrum. So I think it's gonna be pretty thin bodied, but uh, hopefully we got enough conversion and uh, we'll find out momentarily when I get the gravities. So seeing as we're brewing a lager here, um, something I forgot to point out in the recipe section of this. So Pilsner malt is notorious for producing a ton of DMS or dimethyl sulfide, which is an off flavor compound that basically tastes like creamed corn. Uh, however, it's a very volatile chemical. So what we want to do is lengthen our boil uh, to make sure that we actually get rid of enough 
uh, of the precursors to DMS so that it doesn't form in the beer at the end of the day. Now, normally, uh, for using a beer that has a heavy portion of Pilsner malt, most people recommend that you actually boil for 90 minutes. So, I've done that before with decent results. However, an unfortunate side effect of that is that it darkens your beer. Now, Pilsner, as most of us know, is supposed to be an extremely pale beer, very light in color. Uh, so, we want to try and get a middle ground between having too dark of a beer and having a risk for DMS. So, what I'm going to do is actually boil for 75 minutes. So that's an hour and 15 minutes. All right, so our pre-boil original gravity sample is ready to go. It's actually cooled down. Uh, so this is the true gravity. It's about 1.032, I think. So that's pretty good. It's pretty close to our target. Also, you can see the boil has begun. So as this is a 75 minute boil, I'm actually gonna add hops at 60 minutes. So 15 minutes from now. Okay, so it's now uh, 60 minutes from the end of the boil. So it's time to add our first uh, hop addition, our bittering hops, which are pearl. So I'm just going to go ahead and dump the one ounce in because that's all we're using. So we're not going to add anything to this until about 10 minutes from the end of the boil. So I'll uh, catch you then. Okay, so it's about 10 minutes from the end of the boil now. So it's time to add a bunch of things. First of all, I'm going to go ahead and add my hops for this round. So that's 0.7 ounces of Haller Tower. All right, next up I'm adding my wort chiller. And then I'm gonna add one tablet of Whirlflock. And now I'm adding some yeast nutrient. Okay, now we let it sit for the last 10 minutes of the boil and then we'll add our final hop addition then. Okay, so it's time to shut off the boil and start the cooling process. And it's time to add our uh, zero minute addition of Palerta, which is the full one ounce. Alright, so I'm cooling down the beer right now. Uh, looks like we got about six gallons post boil, so that's pretty solid. Um, again, to prevent the further development of DMS, I'm leaving the lid off of this up until we get to about 180 degrees, uh, at which point DMS stops becoming volatile or stops evaporating essentially. So at that point, uh, whatever's in the beer is in the beer and it's locked in. So I think we did a pretty good job though. It doesn't smell like there's too much DMS in there. And of course, within German or European light lagers, uh, there's actually a certain allowable amount of DMS that's uh, considered part of the style. So just gotta keep that in mind. Uh, but yeah, fermentation is the next step here. So fermentation is relatively difficult. Um, so being a lager, number one, you have to have a good healthy yeast starter, which you can hear rattling uh, off to the side there uh, on my stir plate. But um, that's been going for a couple days, so we have more than enough yeast. 
Secondly, we need to make sure that it's down to the appropriate pitching temperature. So, as I said, with my Hellas, I've ended up actually pitching this and starting the lager too warm. That is one way to get a little bit of a jump start on the fermentation because lager yeast tends to have a long lag phase. Uh, but that's really not what we need to do right now. Right now it's summer, the water's a bit warmer, so we're not really going to get past 70 degrees using my immersion chiller. So once we get down as low as we can, we'll take the, uh, the wort out of the kettle, we'll transfer it to the fermenter here, and we'll go ahead and keep that in my keyser, which is set at 45 degrees. We're gonna leave that overnight, so uh, by the time I wake up tomorrow, I'll have uh, a wort that's at 45 degrees. So at that point, we'll go ahead and aerate the wort, and then we'll add the full starter, uh, full of yeast and everything. So then, uh, once I pitch the yeast, I'm not expecting to see any activity there for a while, but, uh, We'll let it slowly ferment out. It should take two to three weeks. We'll leave it at 65 degrees. So when we hit a gravity that's about 60 to 70% of the full attenuation of the beer, so I'm talking like 1020, 1025, um, we're gonna actually take it out uh, and start a diacetyl rest, which is basically moving the beer uh, out to room temperature so that it can finish its fermentation at room temperature, 67 to 70 degrees. Uh, what this is going to do is allow the yeast to clean up some of their byproducts, one of which is diacetyl. Diacetyl is a disgusting butterscotch type flavor that you don't want in something like this. Once again, Pilsner is a very pale, delicate beer, so any off flavors that are there are going to be very present in such a beer. So once the diacetyl rest is complete, we'll take it and we'll transfer probably to a keg uh, and then take that keg and lager it. Uh, or take it down to about 32 degrees, 33 degrees, uh, and keep it there for three or four weeks. Just enough time to get it to drop really nice and clean and clear and get crispy. If you're bottling instead of kegging, you can totally bottle after the diacetyl rest is complete and then leave those bottles in the fridge or in, in an environment that's 33 to 34 degrees. Um, and that's gonna give you the ability to lager still but it's gonna be easier to resist the temptation of having uh, a beer every so often until it's fully ready uh, if you just lager in bulk. So I suggest transferring to a secondary fermenter and then lagering that fermenter and then bottling afterwards. Either method is fine, but I personally tend to have very weak uh, restraint and tend to drink most of the bottles before they're fully uh, lagered. So, that's one benefit of having the keg, is I can just lock that keg up and keep it somewhere. But yeah, that's basically all there is to lager fermentation. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than your standard ale fermentation. Uh, but at the end of the day, it comes out as a really nice, clean, crisp, bright-looking beer and something you can be very proud of. Alright, so as you can tell, we've hit about, what is that, 140 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and put the lid on so nothing falls into this. Or flies into it, or something. And we'll let that continue to drop over the course of the next 20 or so minutes. And then I'll go ahead and transfer to the fermenter. So usually I film the transfer from the kettle to the fermenter. Since I'm not pitching the yeast tonight, I'm actually just going to save that part for tomorrow. So our original gravity sample came in. Uh, it's, it's reading about 1044, um, but it's still about 80 degrees, so we got at about a point. And that makes it about 10.45. All right, good morning. Uh, it is the following morning, and uh, I'm on my way to work, but right now, we're just gonna go ahead and aerate the wort and uh, go ahead and pitch the yeast. This time, we are not sacrificing the stir bar, though. Um, because of the way things are, I'm actually gonna do all of that inside the keyser, so I'm just gonna move the camera, and we'll do that. Okay, as is standard with any lager fermentation, once it has hit somewhere between 50 and 80% of its attenuation, uh, you're gonna take it out of lager temperatures and put it in a uh, warm environment, a room temperature environment for two to three days. 
uh, which is going to do what is called a diacetyl rest. Uh, this is where the yeast will finish the fermentation at a higher temperature, and this uh, allows them to actually clean up any bad flavors, byproducts, uh, such as diacetyl, um, that are formed during lager fermentations. So once this has completed its diacetyl rest uh, at two to three days at 67 to 70 degrees, we're gonna go ahead and actually crash this uh, down to lager temperatures before kegging it so that it comes out clean. Okay, so we've uh, hit our final gravity of 1.006, uh, which is surprisingly pretty dry, actually. Uh, but that's that's fine. It's going to go great in this beer style. Uh, though it's only 10 days into fermentation, so I'm going to let this sit for probably another couple days before we keg and start the lagering process, just to, uh, just to be sure that we clean up all of those... Uh, yeast off flavors and sulfur kind of aromas that are coming from this right now. All right, so I performed my diacetyl rest and uh, let this thing finish out its fermentation completely and then I put it into the keg to lager. So the keg um, has actually been on gas gently the entire time, just about 10, 15 PSI, uh, just enough to let the CO2 gradually absorb itself into the beer. Uh, and that has been going on for about three weeks. So while I lagered it and clarified it, I was also carbonating it. Um, not sure if that's really the proper way to do it, but it worked in my favor and I actually really like the final result here. So I've been leaving it at 33 degrees to lager for the last three weeks and um, well, it's sort of worked in the clarifying aspect of things. It's probably going to get brighter as the keg gets emptier. Um, but this yeast I found is just really, really hesitant to drop out even at 33 degrees for three weeks. I can guarantee you that the flavor of this beer is probably going to change for the better as it continues um, to, to mature and lager out further. It'll probably get cleaner and crispier uh, and it definitely will become clearer. But I want to upload a video anyway. I'm getting a little behind in my brewing schedule so I need to be able to push videos out and get beers out of kegs so I can put new ones in. Anyway, let's go ahead and pour this thing. All right, so this one is called Das Rassenmeier Bier. I don't know if I'm saying that right at all, but it came in at 5.2% ABV and 33 IBUs. Uh, that's German for lawnmower beer, by the way. So, thanks to the crappy lighting in here, uh, this definitely looks darker than it is. It is actually quite a nice pale gold. Um, it's not really super straw colored like a classic German Pilsner is, but it is uh, definitely on the lighter end of the spectrum for beers that I've made. I'm not sure if putting it in front of the light closer to the camera or further away is going to make a difference. Um, but I'll upload a photo for the thumbnail so you can get a good sense of what the actual uh, color of this beer is. So like I said earlier, clarity, as I remove the condensation from the glass here, uh, clarity is pretty much there. It's, it's almost bright. Um, give this like another two weeks and as I continue to empty the keg out, it'll get bright and crystal clear and you'll be able to read a newspaper through it. But like right now it's, it's pretty clean. You can see through it pretty easily. Uh, it's got a little tiny, tiny bit of haze, but that's going to go away in time. And then half of that's also condensation from the glass. Uh, Parents is wise for the head. Uh, it's actually held its retention. It's, it's actually got solid head retention. Um, so you saw when I poured it, I had a pretty frothy, pillowy head on that and with very fine bubbles that uh, had good structure. And uh, it's keeping just a little layer of foam on there and it's keeping it quite well. Um, so that's nice to see. Aroma. Aroma, uh, very much just a, a straw, crackery, malty aroma. No real noble hop presence in here, unfortunately. Um, so that's a little bit of a drawback there. Mouthfeel of beer, it's pretty classic. Yeah, you know, even though I don't have the softest water profile here, the beer does have a pretty soft mouthfeel, uh, which is pretty nice to see. It's got good crispy effervescence and uh, just does, um, it does go down real easy. It's a nice, easy drinking lawnmower beer. It's got a pretty solid carbonation bite. Um, but most German Pilsner examples that I've had actually do, so I think I got that part right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and talk about flavor now. Now the flavor is, um, well, it's, it's Pilsner malt. <laughs> it's got the classic crispy, crackery German Pilsner malt flavor that you would expect from a beer like this. Um, it's not 
It's not particularly sweet, it's actually relatively bitter. I think the bitterness is there, it's not like a hoppy bitterness, but it's just enough bitterness to balance out any sweetness. Uh, it finished relatively dry, so I mean it's got, uh, it doesn't have too much of a, a sugary sweetness to it at all. Some of the better examples of Pilsners I've had uh, are, are, are more sugary sweet on the end, um, but I don't necessarily like that. Uh, I'm more of a fan of the drier, more slightly bitter, uh, crispier ones, but um, lagering is definitely doing its job. This is very crispy. There is a slight, slight, little tiny hint of DMS in this um, that my palate's picking up. Just a little tiny bit of corn. Uh, but that's actually allowable by the BJCP in European light lagers, so I'm going to be okay with it. Uh, 75 minute boil, probably took a little risk on it, yeah. Um, next time I'll probably do a 90, but uh, overall it doesn't take away from it too much. Um, I think it's just because I'm really looking for it. The only thing it's missing, and I said this in the aroma section, uh, is, is really the noble hop flavor and aroma. Um, the only way I can really fix that is by getting true noble hops. I could try upping my hopping rates, but it's already at 33 IBUs. So it's probably something to do with the water. So if I were to brew this again and really try to make it a competition style Pilsner, then I would have to start from reverse osmosis water and build a profile from that. But at the meantime, I'm like, I'm very happy drinking this as it is. You know, it's, it's like just around 5% ABV, so it goes down real quick. This is, this is the kind of beer that you give your friends who aren't like craft beer people. Because it's like, yeah, it's like Budweiser, but with flavor and something to actually enjoy. Um, I like this beer, you know, I love brewing German lagers and uh, it's just a fun one to have. It's a good, uh, quick, easy drinking evening beer. You know, Pilsner is not the most exciting style for everybody. I get it, because you know, most macro beer is Pilsner, but uh, it does it justice, I think. Um, next time, yeah, just fix the water and add a little more noble hop aroma and we're good. Uh, I'm gonna give this probably about a seven and a half or eight out of 10 in terms of how good a beer it was. All right, so that's the end of the video. So um, if you brewed the beer, please let me know in the comment section below if you have any other sorts of uh, feedback, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, let me know in the comment section below as long as it's civil. If you liked the video, feel free to hit that like button. And if you like watching me brew beer and talk about beer and do all things beer, please consider hitting that subscribe button. If you do choose to hit that subscribe button, do yourself a favor and also hit the bell notification icon next to it that uh, lets you know every single time I upload a video so you could be the first one to see what beer I'm making. If you are interested in uh, checking out my brewing equipment, I've compiled a list of it down below in the description along with links to Amazon where you can find it for yourself. Uh, full disclosure, if you do click on one of these links, I do earn a small commission, but only if you buy something. And rest assured that money will go right back into the channel, so it's not gonna get wasted. And then last but not least, Feel free to follow me on Instagram. It's at the apartment brewer. So, and I post a little more frequently to Instagram. I usually try to do YouTube every couple weeks or so. Um, but then again, my videos are very big, so it takes me a long time to make them. With Instagram, I can generally snap a shot and upload something pretty quickly, and you can get a heads up on what kind of beer is brewing, literally, and uh, what you might be able to see coming down the pipeline later. So with that, that's all I got for now. So I'm gonna go ahead and finish off the rest of this beer and uh, I will catch you in the next one. So cheers.